All right, hello everyone. Sorry about that, had a little technical problem. Um, so Lily started a new trend. Um, she brought me the order of service from First Baptist Abilene, where she was, to prove she was in church. <laughs> yeah, so uh, everyone who's gone, you gotta bring, bring proof that you were in church. Yes. Okay, let's talk. I, I can give you some suggestions. Are you moving? Yes. What? Oh my God. I didn't know that. Okay. All right, all right. Let's talk. Um, okay. <laughs> all right. Uh, so I was in church last week. Uh, Y'all were here. Uh, Laura Ayala, um, I hope you enjoyed her. Yes. learning about CBF Global Missions. Uh, I was at Crescent Hill Baptist Church in Louisville on Saturday week uh, for a lecture series, uh, and some of you saw that stuff on Facebook. David Gushy gave the lecture, and then I moderated a panel discussion with six panelists, a really great panel, uh, afterward, and it was all streamed live on Facebook, and we had a lot of views on that. It was very interesting. And then Sunday morning... Um, I went to church at uh, Highland Baptist in Louisville, where Allison and I were members, oh, 30 years ago. Uh, uh, when the boys were born, we were members there, and Phil Christopher was our pastor there, uh, Lily, uh, who then went to First Baptist Abilene from there. And uh, it was a crazy Sunday, though, that I chose to be there. I didn't know this. Uh, they are... This is, you're going to appreciate this. It's an old building. It's an old, old church. Beautiful, beautiful, one of the most beautiful sanctuaries in America. It's stone. It's wood. It's just it's spectacular. But in the old part of the building, they're having to do an HVAC renovation. And they're, like, replacing the carpet and the lighting of the sanctuary and all that. $3.8 million for HVAC work. Now, that's not sexy, but somehow they're doing it. I hope they put in a lot of fire suppression equipment. <laughs> yeah, I know. Well, that's what, uh, I I anyhow, but so that was going on. So they were meeting in their fellowship hall, but that's not the big problem. The Louisville Iron Man was happening that morning, and the course runs directly in front of the church. Oh, so it's very difficult to get there. I got there, almost didn't get out. Afterwards, so most of their members were not there; they were watching online. And so, a church that would have normally had three hundred people had like fifty people in the room. <laughs> and it was, but it was good to be there uh, for that, and nice to hear Mary Alice Bird whistle, who's the pastor there, who delivered one of the finest sermons I've ever heard. And uh, I am very critical of preachers and their sermons, and this was really, really outstanding. So. Uh, anyone who says women can't preach needs to go hear some women preach. Uh, yeah. That's what that's about. Yeah. Glad to be back with you all uh, today and everyone who's joining us from wherever you may be. Anything we need to catch up on and talk about? Yes. I just have one little thing that should cheer people up this morning. CBS Sunday morning, the Rolling Stones, their summer tour was sponsored by our yeah. <laughs> the Rolling Stones summer tour was, tour was sponsored by AARP. Well, there we are. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah, well, it's accidental. It's drift. <laughs> Do you get that discount? Or you, How do you do it? You get an ARP discount? You get the SAMS discount. Oh, you just get the SAMS discount. Yeah. Oh, you do? Oh, interesting. Okay, well, there you go. All right. All right, stay tuned for more handy tips for saving money. Yeah. So, um, 
Friday, we said farewell to our beloved Dorothy Welch, um, who had been a member of our class in her later days, and uh, lovely service um, here in the sanctuary, and a lot of folks there, very, very nice. And uh, it's, it's been a busy funeral season here at the church, as it turns out. Um, so that was, that was our latest in that. And, uh, you know, if you don't remember, Dorothy would often sit sort of over here with her son from California, Tom, who would come with her. Yeah. Yeah. So Dorothy uh, and her late husband, John, joined Wilshire in 1960. Been here a long time. Her, just a year after you did. Uh, John, I knew John before I knew Dorothy because he was the business manager for the Baptist Standard. Before I was there, but I still knew him, right? And then when, when I got to the Baptist Standard and we joined Wilshire, he was re recently retired at that point, but I still knew him and then got to know Dorothy. And, um, you know, one of the things, if you've ever been on an adventurer's trip with me, uh, Dorothy was probably on it. Uh, and uh, we always had to go find Dorothy in the gift shop when we were ready to leave. <laughs> right? And someone else was with her sometimes. <laughs> right? There you go. Well, um, in our ongoing series on great themes of the Bible, uh, I, I want to talk about something today that I was going to say for the very last one, but not knowing when the end is ever going to be to this series. <clears throat> I'm going to bring it forward. And it, it's not a simple, like most of the great themes we've been talking about are simple words like love or creation or something like that, uh, kindness. Uh, today is a theme that doesn't have a single word to it, but it is a theme that tells us, as Micah 6, 8 says, what does the Lord require of you? And I would say one of the <sighs> biggest questions people have about the Bible is, okay, what does this mean for my life? How am I supposed to live if I'm going to follow Jesus? And sadly, this idea has gotten so messed up that it's very hard sometimes to figure out what reality is because people, including a lot of preachers and theologians, with their own lens, their own agenda, have missed the boat on this. <clears throat> they have lost the script, and uh, it's a reminder to us all, if we're going to follow the Bible's teachings, there are some very clear things that we're told this is what the Lord requires of us. And this goes back into Old Testament times as well as into New Testament times. And the reason we forget these things is because it's really hard. Uh, it's much easier to post the Ten Commandments in a school classroom and say you've done the Lord's will. When all you've done is just put some words up there. If you're not living those words, it doesn't matter. So, uh, let me get my right sheet here. We'll get to Micah 6, 8 in a bit. Uh, I don't want to start there. You know that one. What does the Lord require of you? But how do you... I'm just saying what things people... Well, hang on. We're not there yet. You got to hold on. Yeah, yeah, but you're not. We're not to Micah yet. Hang on. <clears throat> I said I'm going to get to Micah later. Later. <laughs> okay. I, I want to start in Deuteronomy chapter five. Deuteronomy chapter five. So this is your sword drill. Deuteronomy chapter 5, verses 1 through 22. You're going to recognize some of this. Moses convened all Israel and said to them, Hear, O Israel, the statutes and ordinances that I am addressing to you today, you shall learn them and observe them diligently. The Lord our God made a covenant with us at Horeb, not with our ancestors did the Lord make this covenant, but with us who are all of us here alive today. Remember, early on in this series, we had a lesson on covenants. Covenants is a big theme. 
And this is God's covenant with Moses and the children of Israel, which is one in a series of covenants. Verse 4. The Lord spoke with you face to face at the mountain <clears throat> out of the fire. At that time, I was standing between the Lord and you to declare to you the words of the Lord. For you were afraid because of the fire and did not go up the mountain. Well, that's a little bit of revisionist history here. Uh, the people were not invited up the mountain. God invited Moses up the mountain, but he's, what he's trying to say here is, I was your intermediary in this. And the Lord said, <clears throat> verse 6, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. Commandment 1. You shall not make for yourselves an idol, whether in the form of anything that is in heaven above or that is on the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. <clears throat> you shall not bow down to them or worship them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing children for the iniquities of parents to the third and fourth generation of those who reject me. Let's talk about that in a minute. But showing steadfast love to the thousandth generation of those who love me and keep my commandments. Second commandment, right? And here, Moses quotes God and is going to great lengths to say, that this issue of making an idol is very, very important to them. Why? Because this is the threat of the other religions all around them. This is the way they were going to distinguish themselves by worshiping God, not by worshiping idols. So <clears throat> nothing in the earth or above the earth or in the water under the earth. Well, you can easily figure this out. People were carving statues and idols uh, of sea serpents and people and other crazy... I mean, you've seen these in museums, right? Uh, you, you know what we're talking about here, and he's covering all the bases. And you can really camp out on this thing where I, God punishes children for the iniquities of parents to the third and fourth generation, but you got to contrast that, that God shows steadfast love to the thousandth generation, the steadfast love of God is greater than the punishment of God. And I think most of us moderns would say we understand generational punishment not as something God vindictively does, but as the reality of sociology. That the sins of the parents are visited upon their children and grandchildren, not because the children and grandchildren are guilty, but because they are trapped in the economic, social system of this. So uh, all these folks who want to claim that there is no uh, long-term legacy of slavery, for example, need to come read Genesis. I mean, Deuteronomy. They need to come read this because God says this is what happens. Marilyn? No, I've always believed that it didn't, it didn't matter about the generational curse. It's the punishment coming down when you accepted Jesus. Okay, so Marilyn says her understanding is when you accept Jesus, everything has changed. And I agree with you, but I would add there are still repercussions for sins. Uh, okay, so think, think about alcoholism as an inherited trait. Think about uh, domestic violence as an inherited trait. Think about things that p children are conditioned in a way. Now, you know, the, the thing is, most... A lot of the time, children escape the bad things of their childhood. A lot of times they end up in therapy with Susan uh, because of this and, and other people. Uh, and they find their way through, right? But a lot of times, children and grandchildren end up repeating the sins of the fathers and mothers without even knowing what they are doing because of how they've been raised. And this is not ideal in any way. And we know that a single intervention can change the course of a child's life, whether that be a teacher or a coach or a neighbor or a Sunday school teacher. We all know stories, some of you have stories, of some adult in your life who was like the bumper in a pinball machine 
who just knocked you the other direction, not in a violent way, uh, but you know, helped you find another course. And this is why all of these types of people are important in our lives because there is a way out of this, but it requires some compassion as well. That's more of a sermon that I intended to give on that. <laughs> Verse 11, you shall not make wrongful use of the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not acquit anyone who misuses his name. A fundamental teaching of the Old Testament is that names matter. Names matter. And this is why one of the greatest insults you can give someone is to mispronounce their name, especially to do it on purpose. This is cruel. It is vindictive. It is petty. And that's not just true of presidential candidates. It's true of people who will not identify and recognize the sexual, the gender of someone who's chosen to tell you what their gender is. One of the greatest offenses uh, a transgender person can experience is when someone refuses to call them by their proper name. If you call them by their previous name, it's called dead naming. This is the, the, the word for this. And it's like sticking a knife in their heart. And it's one of the most disrespectful, ugly things you can do. And all throughout the Old Testament, from the beginning... Adam and Eve are given the ability to name the animals. And then we get great emphasis on the names of people who are born and what those names mean. And the names are sacred, right? Uh, throughout the Bible, th this could be a whole other theme, a sub-theme, is names. And here, this brings us into focus on the name of the Lord. Uh, now, it could be, it could be that uh, this is related. Oh, well, let me ask this. So when you were growing up as a kid, uh, not taking the Lord's name in vain, what did that mean to you? How was that interpreted to you? What were you not supposed to do? Swear. You're not supposed to swear. Right. Not to use the Lord's name in vain. Oh, for, the, for some of us, you couldn't even use euphemisms, alleged euphemisms. Uh, yeah, golly, uh, anything that, yeah, darn. Yeah, which clear is a substitute for damn. I said that one time, and I'm making a full car. The silence was deadly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's funny because the commandment is about the name of the Lord, not about swearing in general, right? So that's a whole different thing. But, uh, you know, this is epidemic today. Yeah. I just got a message from Bob's daughter. She, they're not letting people go up to the third floor. There's a man up there yelling that he's Jesus. The place has been called. Okay. And there's a backpack out here. Nobody knows who it belongs to. So she says, just be vigilant. Oh, my gosh. So, that man, well, I mean, this man that she's talking about, I refer to him as Welcome Desk. That's how I'm like. Yeah. And... So what about the backpack? There's a backpack out there, nobody's touching it because they don't know who's in it. Well, I wonder if we should be in this room. Is it right outside the door? It's down toward the coffee. Okay, it's farther down. Yeah, it's in that area. Yeah, it's farther down. Yeah, okay, okay. For those at home watching, we just had an interruption with a security threat in the building somewhere else, and we're trying to decide what we're going to do here. Uh, with with this, so. Okay, I'm going to text my daughter. Okay. But let's yeah. stop right now and say, dear God, Teresa, safety. Um, for the people that are coming, wisdom to know how to react, and for calmness. Amen. Amen. Carolyn was right on top of it. Her daughter was. Right okay. She's probably busy. Yeah. Okay. Um, so let me just ask you this one more time. How far away from us is the backpack? It's down in the coffee area, one of the seating areas. Call this all the places. Yeah. It's in the chair down there. 
We're having a slight pause in this that we have been alerted, as Mark said, that there's somebody on the third floor. Do you have more? Okay, um, y'all, let's, let's get out of this room. Okay. All right, we're going to leave live streaming. Are you going to take us with it? Am I going to hold it? Well, the problem is it's really hot outside. <laughs> All right. So we're going to stop for right now. If we were able to get back on, we will. Okay. okay. Uh, let's.